Okay, the official hello. Hi, everyone. I've seen our numbers have gotten to the point that we're ready to officially kick things off. Welcome to Crest Fest 2021. We are so excited to have you here and to have our first kickoff with two amazing guests. Before I get ahead of myself, I should tell you who I am. I'm Melissa Mels Kuhn. I'm the director of the Motion Light Lab at Gallaudet University. I'm also co-founder of the Crest Network and co-host of today's event and festival. Now, of course, this is not a solo project. It is, of course, a team effort. And so a number of people have worked to make this possible, including my colleague, Lorna Quant. We are both so excited to have everyone with us today. CREST, as many of you may already know, stands for Cultivating Research and Equity in Sign-Related Technology. We know that this field today, the combination of technology and sign language is certainly on the rise and is a popular topic. And so it, we want to be mindful of deaf representation and equity. A major line of conversation is that this is not just going to be about a few people and a few people's minds, but it's going or thoughts, but it will be a truly collective effort. That's the goal of creating this network, bringing together people that are already working in the field to bring your expertise together and to increase deaf representation and participation, as well as deaf researchers and deaf talent in this area for years to come. So without further ado, we have with us today two outstanding guests, Miles DeBastian from Sima Space. He'll tell you more about what he does. We've already released his lecture or his presentation. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch it. He works in virtual reality, captioning, immersive experiences. Miles will be joined by Toby Fitch, who is also incredible in his own right. I have dubbed him a sort of man of many talents. He dabbles in a number of fields and has a wide range of experiences, all relating to design, visual arts, photography. So we are very excited to have both of them here with us today and to watch their conversation. Now, before that begins, we do have to have a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A feature of Zoom. We'll use the chat for any sorts of comments that we have among the team behind the scenes to help offer support. All right, with that, let's enjoy today's event. Miles and Toby, will you turn your cameras on, please? Hello. Hi. And could we spotlight or have each of them spotlighted, please? Great. All right. Well, with that, I will turn off my video and let you two take it away. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Miles, too, would you like would you like to begin with an introduction? Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started on the path that led you to where you are today. Sure thing. Hi. I'm Miles Sebastian. And my sign name is like this on the left side of my chest. I live in Portland, Oregon. And I founded a nonprofit called Sima Space. And the sign is like this. Our goal is to make sure that deaf and hard of hearing people are included in the art and media space, particularly with technology and education. My new project is actually more in line with VR and immersive experiences and creating immersive experiences and VR for deaf people to be able to incorporate sign language and captioning, which is rare to have support for captioning and sign language in VR technologies. So I'm working on how to improve that technology and also provide solutions for that problem. Definitely. I think accessibility in technology is an ever-present issue. 
as for my background in design, it is certainly something that we always struggle with to ensure that every person is represented and included in virtual spaces. It's again, a constant challenge. Right. So can you tell me a little bit about why you felt it was important to have that kind of access in virtual reality? What is it that's um, required for accessibility in VR? What does that even mean really? That's a really good question. And really, you know, with COVID-19, it means that venues were shut down and people couldn't meet face to face. So there was a lot more isolation. I know things are improving, but that really showed the importance of having accessible online digital places for people to meet. Zoom, like we're using it right now, can be a little awkward. I wanna be able to reference people in a physical space like I would in an actual physical space in the digital realm. And that's not possible on Zoom, but with VR and 3D world, it's a different digital experience. You feel like you're actually there in a space and that's really exciting. And that can be really awesome for deaf people to be able to meet other people and have other forms of visual communication. You can point to people in the space, you can hold things virtually, you can interact with different worlds. So I think that's really going to become the future of how we interact and socialize and even work and create partnerships with people. So that's really exciting. And at the same time, I notice when I go into virtual spaces and I'm using those technologies, they're not accessible for me. It's rare to be able to have captioning and, and where do you even put the captioning? You know, if you're looking around in a 3D kind of environment and you can miss the captioning if it's on the other place apart, apart from where you're looking. So where captions are placed in a 3D environment has been a real design challenge. And I prefer to communicate through sign language, but you can't really sign while holding some of these different peripherals Exactly. So that's another usability problem too. And I think if these two issues are resolved, then we'd see more deaf people being really eager and excited about joining virtual reality spaces and using that kind of technology. I completely agree. I remember the first time that I basically joined Microsoft um, and I played around with their VR technology and I questioned why we couldn't or why I couldn't fully express myself. Everything was so audio based. So I had visual access, but right. no access to the auditory information. And I was really struck by that. I realized that I can sort of get by in the real world, the physical world, but in virtual spaces, I couldn't get by. I had to get really creative. So I remembered I tried Facebook's headset. Let me see. When I put those on, I realized that I could call someone on Facebook message. Mm -hmm. And it actually felt like making a call. So I called my dad. My dad is deaf. But I didn't let him know what I was doing and how I was calling him. I just went ahead and placed the call out of the blue dad answers the phone and instantly saw I could see his reaction because he was looking at an avatar but the avatar looked a lot like me so I had that controller that you just held up and so I waved that very same controller to say hi to my dad he said hi back but you could tell by his face that he was mm -hmm. still really confused the issue was that I had no control over my digits. So it couldn't read my all of my fingers, only my index fingers and my thumbs. So all I could do was point to myself. I tried making my name sign as best I could, even though I couldn't use all four of my fingers. I went ahead and spelled my name, said I was in VR. And I met, my dad was just blown away. He was floored that we could at least gesture in VR, you know, like, 
if you were to be able to move your hands but not flex your fingers at all you could still get by and communicate to some degree sort of like a right right now. yeah mm -hmm. but we had no idea that it was possible so we could do that in a physical world we knew that we could sort of play with gesture there but we didn't realize that it would be possible in a virtual world even though the readability for the digits and the full hand is not available yet can you tell me more about how my this experience of mine, which was four years ago, and it was very limited because I couldn't use my middle ring or pinky fingers. Could you tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit about what is possible now and what the limitations are that still exist? Sure, sure. Well, the VR industry continues to grow and improve upon itself by leaps and bounds. And the early VR technologies involved having an additional component on the headset and that could detect hand shapes but it was not integrated into the full experience so a community of developers and engineers trying to resolve this limitation there's been some improvement and I'm really excited to see an example with Facebook's Oculus. Now it's much cheaper. And there's also a front facing camera. I actually think there's four front facing cameras that can actually recognize hand shapes, full hand shapes. So it's getting there. There's still some limitations where it can't read to if whether or not the hands are on top of each other so it'll glitch if that happens but i was pretty impressed that means that we can get rid of this, this controller you can actually start using your hands in the vr space it's now more affordable in terms of headset technologies so i'm really excited because i i, I bought one, I really wanted to check it out. Now we're able to involve sign language, sign language technologies. There are other VR headsets available other than the Oculus, but they tend to be more expensive. Right, I use other headsets too, like the HoloLens. And mm -hmm. I would say that the HoloLens wasn't exactly just VR and exactly it's really pricey, but it wasn't just VR. It really was sort of mixed reality. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I could put it on a real world table and it would stand alone. So it would interact with physical objects. But I thought the cool thing about the HoloLens is that the technology behind it is just amazing. The fact that it can recognize my hands is incredible. But one thing that did occur to me is that design needs to be more equitable. Meaning, let's say that I am missing a pinky in real life. In VR, I would still have all five fingers. I think that they should be modifiable to reflect your anatomy in real life so if you don't want a finger that you don't have in real life to be present or if you do want a finger to be present in the virtual world if you don't have it physically a user should have the ability to make those modifications on their own but i think it's still new and we're still learning <clears throat> i think also the more that deaf people are involved in these processes the more we can make these spaces more accessible for everyone not just deaf people but for blind people as well, or people who have physical limitations, cognitive or neuro, uh, neurological conditions as well. I'd like to take a moment and take a look at the Q&A and chat to see if anyone in the audience has posted a question. Has posted a question. Okay, Miles, we have a question for you from the audience. 
Can the limitations with VR headsets be quote unquote complemented with VR gloves, also known as the signing gloves? Mm -hmm. I'll let you answer that. It's funny because many people think that sign language gloves would fix everything, but that's not the case. First of all, they're not comfortable. You expect deaf people wanting to accept the technology. They're not going to want to wear gloves that are uncomfortable and too hot. Also, they don't capture the facial expressions that people, people will miss that and it's a critical part of sign language and gloves will miss that. Also, it increases costs and complications in terms of engineering and development. I know there's some development with a wrist technology. They're not gloves to be able to do a muscle detection, to be able to detect hand shapes that way. They're still a little bit awkward in terms of their usability. The recognition is not from a camera, but the processing power is a question with these wrist devices. And the AI model needs more data, data to be collected to actually be effective. But we need good quality data collection as well as modeling for that kind of AI to be effective. Right. I think that the point about artificial intelligence also relates to it, what I think is a very interesting field where there's a push for VR to go to the next level. This is like what you and I were talking about. <clears throat> oh, let me wait. Did I freeze just now? Nope. Okay, just, I wasn't sure um, since you were looking off screen. Uh, I'm just testing something out actually. Oh, okay. Ah, great. So this is an example of an AI model. And it is only being used with a camera, not gloves. This is camera recognition. So this is pretty quick in terms of its ability to capture fast motion. And this was done using AI? Mm-hmm. How did that work? Like the camera just needed to be able to see your whole hand and that was it? It's just one perspective also. There's enough data also to fill in the gaps as well as processing power. So I just wanted to show you that. That's great. Another thing with AI is that I think that there is a challenge around <clears throat> translating. So for example, there is speech to text, but the challenge or the challenge is in not just speech to text, but going from sign to text Mm -hmm. is, right. really opens up a lot of questions. I think sign to text is an additional challenge because you're still limited by not having access to the facial expression that we know is such an important part of ASL. Can you say more about that? I just wanted to put that, that link. So I'm sorry, I missed that last piece. Oh, sure. I just was talking about speech to text versus sign to text. While I think that the idea is pretty cool, I know that there are still challenges in going from sign to text, partly 
because facial expressions are so key to the language and mouthing also can be somewhat flexible, or excuse me, with speech, I know that you face some of the same issues because text doesn't pick up on the tone that someone might be saying something in. But in ASL, the facial expressions go beyond tone, mm -hmm. but would it be able to capture something like the tone of angry signing? So in other words, how, how close do you think we are to getting sign to text um, automated sign to text representation. I think <laughs> well, that's yeah, a complicated question. I mean, really, we need to be able to add facial expression and mouthing recognition, not just hand tape recognition. So that's an important component. And I think that's going to happen soon. It's already happening. There's a new HTC component that's being added to the camera. And it actually forward, it's facing the person's mouth and can capture mouth movements. There's also cat front facing camera inside the VR headset that can might be able to capture eyebrow expression, eyebrow movement. So it's all about camera placement and capture. So it is technically possible to be able to do sign language capture. Yeah, the processing power we need high quality data with the full, with all of the components and parameters of sign language present. And once we have a lot of this data collected and then we're able to feed it into AI models. And that kind of processing power will be very similar in terms of speech to text that conceptually is very similar. And I think that's on the horizon. I can't say exactly when, but I would say maybe within, depending on the hardware that would be available first. I mean, one to two years, three years for the hardware to be able to have more cameras to do, be able to do that kind of recognition and detection. And I think that will then lead to the development and the acceleration of being able to have more sign language rec recognition be possible. So I'd love to see this happen in the next, let's say five years or so. I think part of the challenge is balancing what people want in a VR headset. So for example, the challenge with wearing a headset sometimes has to do with just the physicality of it, having a cord go from the headset to a computer. So you're tethered in order to get more processing power. And I think that there's mm -hmm. currently a trend toward more wireless devices, but the trade-off means a decreased capacity for those headsets to have additional sensories. So I think that it's really a set of trade-offs of power and capability on the one hand, but then being tethered to your computer or PC. And then on the other hand, if you go wireless and you don't have the tethering concern, then you lose some of that processing power. I think it's a tough balance to strike. All right, let me check in on audience questions. Okay, I see two. The first is from Jennifer Story. She's saying there's no quote unquote translation involved here, correct? It's real time representation of the hands and body. So I guess this is in reference to real time translation. Do we have that for sign to text already? Yeah, I know there was another presenter during this crest, the crest fest. I was watching one of the videos this morning, presenter from England, and he's working with coding technologies, the coding technologies that are behind the translation process to be able to go from sign to text. So I, already, I know that academia, there are some researchers who are working on that in academic contexts and they have the same problem where there aren't enough 
there isn't enough data. There is not enough data of deaf people signing. And so there are people in the tech field who are working on that. Right. I mean, hearing people who, hearing people who don't know sign language aren't able to fully work in this space and develop this space. So we need more signing people in this tech space. I completely agree. I think more deaf people need to be involved in design, development, all aspects really. Hopefully we'll see that happen. Okay, <clears throat> let's move on to the second question in the Q&A. Which approaches do you think will lead to more higher quality socialization in virtual reality? Full sign language UI? Oh wait, hold on one second. I see a clarification <clears throat> to the previous question. Which appro oh, so finishing out the question I was just reading, which do you think will lead to more higher quality socialization in VR, full sign language UI or ASL to English AI translations? Which of those two options do you think will lead to higher or better quality socialization in virtual reality? I think it's a good question. Well, I think we need to look at this more holistically. We want deaf people to be excited and about participating in VR, and becoming interested in the space. They need to be creators themselves, either creating the tech or the world that support deaf people's participation. So it's not necessarily just one thing. Captioning needs to happen. And the technology exists now, but the companies who actually make VR technologies are not prioritizing incorporating captioning yet. It's important to have this feature for deaf people to be able to socialize with hearing people in VR spaces. And then yes, full sign language recognition in the VR environments is also not available yet. So I've been in touch with Rec Room and several other VR companies, Alt Space. Those are the social online environments They don't have sign language support, but they're just starting to add captioning. So I think those two are going to be pretty successful and we'll see inclusion in those two spaces in particular, and then deaf people will start to join them. So I'm particularly excited about those two technologies and more people might be curious and then want to go to school and study how to actually create these kind of environments for themselves and get more involved in digital creation and the VR industry in general. So I think that would also be another result, but more support for the deaf community to be able to also go to school and learn these technical skills to become creators themselves to be able to have scholarships, mentoring experiences, and that's not there right now either. Right. And I'll add to that, that it's not just a lack of a focus on education. I live in Seattle where we have a community organization, um, really just sort of a, a group of people that don't have formal education in VR. Some of them have really vastly different backgrounds from anything tech related but they have a personal interest as an enthusiast or a hobbyist in VR. So they participate in these community events and community groups. They have monthly events that are again, open to anyone who would like to learn new things about VR. So we have a virtual reality meetup. And when the folks in this community come together, it's really just a space to learn from each other because again, VR is so very new. 
I mean, virtual reality, actually, the technology has been around, I know, for years and years, but the idea of VR as we know it with the interactive component as a social space, that concept is still new. So there aren't rules yet. People are still trying to figure out what the rules of interaction are, what they are, how they should be, what the rationale is. It's ultimately up to us what those rules will be. Will be. Much like nowadays, we have research design principles and people, or excuse me, design principles, and people will ask me, you know, for example, what's the best way to do blank? And often my answer is, I don't know. You have to do some research. You have to experiment, test it out, prove what works best. But that's the best way that we know for now. There's always that caveat. Over time, we would have to then revisit that design principle and see if it still holds and if it's still something we should adhere to years from now. It might be, it might not be. I think it's important to always consider and revisit whether notions that we hold today are appropriate to stick with into the future. And I think that this is an important argument when it comes to accessibility, because right now we're all meeting virtually. We're using captioning virtually. Um, you and I have our video on, everyone else is just watching us, but don't have their videos on. So what is needed to communicate fully in a virtual reality, I think applies definitely in a virtual space. It should be interesting to see as it advances. Yeah, I'd like to recommend a group that's called XD Access. And it's a working group that I feel is very supportive. They meet about every two weeks and talk about different topics. And usually I join the one that's related to VR and accessibility. They provide captioning and interpreting. So the meetings are accessible. And the people who are there are from a variety of different backgrounds. There are folks from Google, Verizon, Microsoft, Facebook, all the big tech companies. There are stakeholders who are interested in accessible tech. And then there are also developers and engineers who attend. And many of them I identify as deaf or disabled. And there aren't enough of those folks there. But I feel really welcome in this space, in this community. So it's a great place for people who are interested in this industry and I'm interested in leading the future of the industry. So that's a, a really great group, XR Access. Do you need to already have a tech background? Not always, I would say. It's not needed. There are a lot of people who are interested in this topic from a diverse backgrounds, educators, policymakers, um, and they all tend to be really eager about seeing more disability inclusion in VR and AR and various forms of uh, digital reality. Great, thank you for that. Um, let's switch to the next question. Thank you to the audience for the steady stream of questions that you've been supplying us with. All right, so uh, let's... The next question is from Mark McGuire. What kind of roles can deaf people fill in order to be part of the tech movement? Meaning, are we in need of creatives or technicians or a blend of the two? For example, oh, well, I'll leave it there. Would you like to answer Mark's question? Well, deaf people can do everything, right? <laughs> right. So the opportunity, the field is wide open for participation in a variety of different ways. I mean, people are really hungry for the deaf perspective. And people are really having this awakening, hearing people who are developers and tech experts or not experts when it comes to deaf and signing communities. And they're realizing that they need the expertise of those, those people having those experiences. We have to 
think less about creating for communities and rather supporting communities to create and design for their own needs and make technologies and be welcome into these spaces and mentored. So that's something that I'm really interested in doing and seeing transitioning into empowering more deaf people to figure out their own technical solutions for accessibility and for providing the deaf perspective in tech, whether it's through artistic expression or engineering. I'd like to see more resources available for that to happen. Programs for mentorship maybe and there are not enough people, deaf people with the expertise in terms of coding and design to be able to design hardware and software for these spaces. So really we need more mentorship and funding and investment in these spaces to set up training programs. I completely so agree. that's something that I'm really eager and in participating into. Yeah, to add to that, I think that when thinking about VR, that we often think of it as the wild west at the moment anyway, because at the moment, anything can happen. It's sort of a blank slate for us to interact and it's there for right. you to make of it what you will. And it's just a matter of each person taking the initiative to do what they want. So I think that we also need more of that, more self-starters, I do think it'll be more of a challenge and there will still be barriers that we'll confront. I face barriers regularly. I'm sure you do too, Miles. I'm sure that you encounter barriers. So, and for the audience, uh, Miles and I had a pretty nice long conversation the other day about this very topic. Miles, would you like to share more about how we can break these barriers down? I know a lot of it is work that we have to do to get through to people and make sure that they understand how important it is that we be represented versus just waiting for the opportunity to present itself. But there will never be a right moment. You just have to go for it and do it, which is true in other fields as well. In every field, I'm sure that we face these same sorts of challenges, that there's going to have to be someone who's a self-starter and willing to be a pioneer and make this impact. I think it's important that someone has that drive or desire to create a space, not just for ourselves, but spaces for other groups of people who might not have the same kind of access either. Yes, right. Yeah, really, I say just show up, you know, right. just to not be afraid. I mean, I know it seems a little daunting sometimes as deaf people and you're going to spaces and where they're hearing people and you can't hear and you're struggling for access and it can be really exhausting and you want to participate in a group and they're not really understanding your needs in terms of providing access and you get tired of having to advocate for your access needs and, you know, I want my work my time to be productive, not just struggling to have my access needs met. But I'd say now I've, that I've been involved in this industry for the past 10 years, it's not as hard as it used to be. People are seemingly a little bit more understanding and empathetic and a little bit more ready to actually be helpful. Um, we have captioning available in Zoom and in Google Meets and those are really great technologies and features available. They're finally available. I think just being willing to just get in there and not being afraid. And then maybe also mentoring with other deaf people so that you don't feel alone and isolated and you have someone who understands your perspective. I think that's really important too. Yeah, I think one part of the problem, maybe a small part of it, is that historically design thinking was not inclusive of accessibility. Most times design is just seen, at, well, it's focused on visual aspects, but designers have become increasingly aware of other things to consider, physical access, visual access, engineering. So the list of considerations is longer and the field has become more mature. I'd say that early on it was an immature field and I 
really am still looking forward to where this leads in terms of accessibility in general, not just for deaf people. But on the point of exhaustion, I also completely relate with that, that it's so tempting at times to just say, I give up, I'm done with it, I've had it. But at the same time, it's heartbreaking because you want, you know that that drive and desire helps everyone. And that's, I think, part of what keeps me going. But definitely, I have my days where I don't feel like keeping on and um, thinking of other people is what keeps me heartened. All right, let's check in with questions again. Okay, we have a long one. This audience member has asked, I'm not sure why we keep focusing on physical gear. Isn't there laser technology from phones and other types of devices that can sense face proximity and gestures? Doesn't that area have potential? Yeah. I was actually recently involved in the Epic Game Fellowship. And I was learning about their game machine, the game engine. There was Unreal Engine. And they're not working on just games now, but also for filming and being able to broadcast online events. So I was really interested in that technology and developing tools for mobile devices and how that could feed into this engine, as well as facial recognition and facial expression recognition. So there's potential application there for characters to have more facial expression. So I was experimenting with that. Also working with depth detection. Did you use Unity for that? Yeah, Unity and another popular game develop an engine. I hadn't used Unity. That one is a little bit more dependent on code. It's a more code heavy. Might be better, but like you, I'm much more of a visual designer and creator. So the Unreal Engine has what's called the visual programming system. It works with nodes and connecting the nodes together. So you don't actually need to learn a lot of code. It's much more low level descriptions. It's much more visual. So I understand how all of the different functions are interconnected and relate to each other. And I find it to be more deaf friendly. So that was something I, why I chose to go with Unreal Engine. The reason I ask is because I've had some experience with Unity in my background. And what I did was that I would sometimes model things out in 3D. So build it out, get an idea of how things would work. And then I would ask an engineer if they could make, you know, that thing move or make it interactive. So I would tap them for other ideas and that would make it easier for me because I just had to sort of build or construct the idea and then I would hand it over to an engineer, the engineer would be the one to take that 3D model and make the modifications needed to make it physically work. I think it's analogous to designing for websites. Let's say that I design a layout for you know, something to be online. I would give it to an engineer and they make the pieces move. They make all the parts move. So it's the same concept. I found that process to be really fun because I, again, I just had to focus on making things, but someone else in the process is the one that focused on making it interactive. Um, but I know that Unreal Engine is also really amazing. And I think that both Unity and Unreal Engine have, its pro have their pros and cons, just depending on what your needs are. Yeah, I think it's a uh, more powerful. I don't wanna necessarily always be relying on engineers and programmers 
I want to be able to actually implement things myself and then create these experiences and adjust as needed. So I see this transition into more to low code or no code platforms and having more of an investment there so that people who don't want to or who can't or who don't have the time to learn how to code or coding basics are still able to be creative and create functional apps and systems. So I think we're going to see more natural language programming too, where people I know, hopefully we'll be able to have this sort of sign language interface, but right now people can talk into the interface and interact with the AI to help with the implementation. And this allows all people to be creators. And I think that that would be really cool because we all have perspectives and stories to share. And we won't need to be dependent on people who have these high level technical expertise to only have the power to be the creators. All people will be able to create things. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. Another thing that I think about when it comes to creator is that I think that deaf people have a unique perspective, particularly in relation to virtual reality because our language is visual. So for example, if you look at Microsoft's HoloLens, they have a gestural component and their, their menu is gestural. But mm -hmm. I, I question if we could then use that and apply it to sign language. I think that would be one example of deaf gain in a way. In other words, how do we bring our language to benefit a VR space so that we could have features like what we see with the HoloLens menu? Could there you know, be other, even just thinking about the sign for that sort of menu in ASL, how are other, what are other ways where we could bring our perspective to really advance VR in general? Yeah, right. I had been also looking at the Facebook Oculus menu, the way you were able to pinch your fingers. It's so awkward though. Yeah, and this is why we need deaf people in the community to be designers and creators because we have a natural language already that's very clear and spatial. So this would be an incredible segue and tie into VR and could be incredibly beneficial. So I'd like to see a future where you can use sign language as a mode of navigation. Maybe you could sign tree and then the AI will create that. And then you could sign green and then the VR will also create that in the space and deaf people could use sign language to create VR spaces. It's exciting to see what's possible when more people are involved and in being able to create those kind of technologies. Yeah, I kind of want to feel like I have superpowers when I'm there. Like, for example, if I am in a VR space and I want someone to get out of my way, I wish I could just <laughs> brush them away with a flick of my hand and have them fly like, right. all the way to the background. VV, VV. All right. Well, we are approaching the end of the hour. So I want to look at the QA, see if we have any other questions that we'd like to address. Okay. What are some barriers in establishing widespread standards in accessibility for VR or XR, especially in regards to sign language technology? How can they be overcome? Yeah, I think we already talked about the hardware itself. I think also policies, the gatekeepers, typically large tech companies like Facebook, Microsoft, Google. They're the ones with the power right now. They're deciding what's being prioritized in terms of development. So if they decide that they don't necessarily 
want they they want to decide that they want the deaf perspective they could make that happen but that's not what's happening there's not enough deaf representation on teams doing this kind of research and development so they could be hiring more deaf people including more deaf people and then there would be more of a voice in the corporate world i completely agree so in terms of X, xr accessibility policies could establish could be established so i think there's an opportunity there to really educate these large tech corporations and and hardware and software makers and barriers if i as i said that there are not enough deaf people who have these technical skills that are needed and we need more support resources, mentorship, training and education for deaf people to enter the tech sector and indus these industries and meetups like we've mentioned and again cost really. We want to see technologies become more and more affordable. We everyone has a phone, mobile phone, and I think that might be true in the future for VR. Ideas, Toby? Yeah, I think one main area is education. And by that, I mean educating our colleagues, educating people who work in the area of VR to say, hey, there's a huge gap here, and to draw their attention to the fact that it's a gap that needs to be filled because it can benefit everyone. It's not just a matter of doing something only for deaf mm -hmm. people, but it would be right. beneficial more broadly. I think that that idea is still pretty new. I don't think it should be new. Um, I think it should have happened a long time ago. Another issue that I do see is funding for sure. Like you said, I know that money is a big issue and VR is so new right now. I think that the main interest lies in what will generate income and what will draw people in. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, sadly, I think that accessibility is a low priority and it's not a hot topic, but I think it should be. And we should make that space available right. for people like us. Deaf and disabled people have money. Deaf and disabled people will buy devices. So we need to convince businesses and the people who are creating these devices that working with deaf and disabled people are good opportunities and are marketable opportunities for them. So that's part of this policy piece. The wealth that the community has and that de disabled people have, they, we do have buying power. And we need to convince these corporations that we need these devices to be accessible. Uh, are we still connected? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I was just looking off screen at the camera, uh, excuse me, at the questions and getting caught up. Um, I was just reviewing what we had and thought we would choose one last question to wrap up. Julie asked, Are you saying that there's the exploration of sign language technology that we use sign language visually to create visual coding that can be translated into actual natural coding? What an idea. Yeah, we want this now. Right? That would be amazing. Um, as far as I know, no, nothing like that exists at the moment. But again, VR is so new that we don't have a lot of um, tools, in other words, to build things within VR. The tools are pretty limited at the moment in terms of how to build things. Mm -hmm. Right. Code. So if we don't have those tools, then obviously you can't build something that requires tools that are not available. Miles, would you like to add to that? 
Yeah, I think, is there time for one more question? Yeah. I think, oh. <laughs> Hello, Kat. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so another person has asked what VR is doing to develop tools to improve or use sign language processing. And to restate, what is the VR field doing to create things that use sign language processing? I think to restate, it's like, I think the person's asking, what are people doing to make sign language processing a possibility in a VR space? So I think they're asking more about what processes are underway. So my goal is to set up tools and guidelines and what's available and share that with developers to make it easier for them to support sign language recognition in their apps, as well as captioning to be able to communicate in VR spaces. So that's still in development. I'm looking for some more support resources to take that further. There's some limitations in terms of cloud computing and AI in terms of resource that's required for the, to make that happen. So my goal is to help developers themselves, not necessarily from, for them to make these the software from scratch, but to develop best practices and what would be effective for the deaf community to interact in VR spaces. So I'm hoping that can help to create more accessibility. And I actually have another example that I'd like to show just in a brief video. So this is something that you can download now if you have an Oculus, an Oculus VR set. You can meet another person who also has the same headset and sign together. So it feels great to be able to sign with someone in this space. And would we still be able to communicate without having a face or facial expression? I mean, you're getting by. I mean, you're able to have some basic conversation in VR. You know, I know there's definitely room for improvement. So I can also drop the link in the chat and I'd be happy to meet you in the Oculus system. It'll be fun to chat. It's multiplayer hand tracking. And it's here on the SideQuest website and I'll share this link too. Great, well, I'm, oh, I'll make sure you can both see me. Toby, looks like time is up. That's right, thank you so much. I just wanted to close out by thanking both of you for what has been an amazing discussion. I think we certainly see new ideas coming up already just in the last hour. Again, thank you so much for being with us today, Toby and Miles. Miles, thank you so much for the video that you created with the longer presentation. And thank you for everyone in the audience for your outstanding questions. And look in the chat box for a link to more events that we're having as part of the Crest Fest. This is our first event that kicks off the festival. We have six more lined up. So keep an eye out. We're certainly looking forward to all of those events. So keep an eye out and attend the ones that are of interest to you. Thank you again, everyone, and happy Crest Fest. Thank you so much. Thank you.